Charles Davis from Fox Sports and the NFL Network. He's an analyst, but covers a lot of different things and gives perspective on our sport and the people of our sport in fantastic ways. So welcome to the show this morning, Charles. How you doing? I'm doing great, Tiki. It's great to hear your voice. Hope you're doing well. You know what? Let me ask you this question because it bothered me as soon as I heard this. Actually, I heard it over the weekend because I was down in Tampa with my brother, and he was talking about the quarterback, the backup quarterback of his Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Mike Glennon. And, it, yeah. and he started hearing reports uh, from, I'm sure, just like you do, being in the industry, about how much he was going to get paid. And I looked yeah. at him and I said, are you kidding me? I mean, I retired <laughs> from the National Football League 10 years ago, almost 11 seasons ago. I stopped playing. The market for a running back was about, you know, five and a half, six million dollars. It's still five and a half, six <laughs> million dollars. And now you get backup quality quarterbacks making 14 million dollars a season there's an imbalance here and I think there's a problem when it comes to quote respect in the locker room when this type of 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 money gets handed out to a guy who hasn't earned it yet well if if you take it to last year about the best case study we can have is Brock Osweiler getting 72 million and coming out of a place where he won some games, but didn't finish the season as a start. It went back to Peyton, which you can understand. You know, you're gonna, if you're going to take your chance, you're going to take a chance with Peyton Manning. And it worked out for Denver. But got $72 million, immediately was the starter. Don't forget there also was the report that he and Bill O'Brien had never met <laughs> when he signed the contract. That's insane. It was an owner's, de- owner's decision. And it didn't work out so well. Are, you, are we surprised? <laughs> they won a division, but not because of Brock. Yeah. You know, is, is that is that dangerous to the league? You know, when you start having these type of situations where it's just it's 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 abject and immediate failure. It's danger. It's a dangerous to the team. And when your owner, if if indeed this is the case, this is what I've been told. I've, I've tried to pin it down. You know, sometimes the story becomes legend. Yeah. So you're never really sure. But if indeed the owner is signing players and then saying those are your guys, coach, that's dangerous to the team. Yeah. Is it great for the league? Probably not. Sometimes it works, but for the most part, you got to have that lockstep. That's why I thought what Atlanta did this year, where they figured it out with the GM Thomas Dimitrov, who had brought in Scott Pioli, who had been a GM. Now he's your assistant. Those two finding common ground to work. And even more importantly, how they work with Dan, with Dan Quinn as their new head coach two years ago. What do you like? What do you like? What do you like? I'm sure there's times that they've broken chairs in meetings, Tiki. Yeah. But they come out of that meeting, and it looks like they're all smiles. So that's how you have to do it. It's worked pretty well for them. Yeah, one more question on the guys in the uh, current guys in the National Football League, and I'll stick with quarterbacks before I get to some of the combine stuff, which is compelling and interesting, especially as it pertains to the quarterbacks. <laughs> but Kirk Cousins, this situation that's, that's transpiring – but Scott McLuhan, who is now MIA from the organization, seemingly wanted to be the guy who wanted to sign Kurt Cousins, but now he's gone-ish. Uh, and yeah. Kurt, it, it feels like this is becoming untenable in a way that's going to implode this team worse than it's kind of ever been. What happens in this situation? That obviously remains to be seen, but while you were in Tampa and I was in Indianapolis, I heard rumblings in Indianapolis, you may have heard the same ones, that Kurt Cousins has asked for a trade. So <laughs> that tells you all you need to know because yeah. for any of us who are sitting on the outside, because I think he's tagged again for the second straight year, right, yep. Kirk Cousins? He is. Somewhere in the neighborhood of $24 million. So if you're tagged for that, I think most people say, tag me. I don't need to worry about anything else. Tag me for $24 million. But if you're the starting quarterback in the NFL who expects some longevity, two years in a row of tagging you tells the rest of the team that the ownership doesn't believe in you. Yeah. And while your teammates believe in you, if that continues to be the message from ownership, it's kind of like the old Chris Rock joke about, you know, you get pulled over for driving your own car and they're telling you you stole it. And after a while, you're like, well, maybe I did steal my own car. <laughs> well, for Kirk Cousins, well, maybe maybe I am not that good. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, that's what he's worried about right now. So that's probably one of the reasons he would love to escape. And it looks like San Francisco would be his preferred destination. Yeah, no, you got to go somewhere where you're wanted. At the end of the day, if you're not – it never turns out well. We're talking, to, we're talking to Charles Davis, who's a Fox Sports and NFL Network analyst and one of the great guys in the National Football League, especially as it comes to information. Now, you were in Indianapolis. You saw all of the current quarterbacks. We've heard all of the they're-not-ready rumblings about all of them. Yeah. But Deshaun Watson uh, showed something. I think he showed he's the superior athlete. He's even, he even proved 
uh, even though it was in their underwear, uh, that he yeah. can take snaps under center and do all the things, the steps, make some of the calls. Uh, where, we, where do we think he'll go? Is he a first-round talent, or are any of these guys really first-round talents? I think the guys are first-round talents, but I'm not sure that many people want to draft them in the first round. I think people would be much more comfortable getting them in the second. I think they feel more comfortable with Andy Dalton territory. You know, getting that guy there. But people, what people have to remember, Brett Favre was a second rounder. Yeah. Okay? We, you know, everyone wants to throw the Brady thing out there. Okay, we got it. Sixth round. That's one of the all-time outliers. But there are a good number of guys that are in the league that have played that are below the first round, but not to the extent where everyone missed on Brady so often, and you get that type of solution. I'm talking about, you know, good, decent quarterbacks you can get later. Remember the word on Dak Prescott. And I was in that camp was third, fourth round last year. That seemed about right. He ended up going in the fourth. Did we think he was ready right away to go play? Probably not. And look at how that turned out. A lot of it is, as you know, Tiki, it's a match between quarterback and his work ethic and organization he goes to and their ability to teach and bring people along. I think that if you look at what last year's Ram staff did with Jared Goff versus what the Cowboys did with Dak Prescott, I think you'll see a difference in approach, a difference in teaching, and a difference in how they put things out there. Now, I know I can hear the Rams who go, oh, but they had the offensive line, they had Zeke, they had this. Watch the tape of Dak Prescott from the beginning to the end. He started the season, the preseason, almost exclusively in gun because yeah. that's what he did at Mississippi State. By the time the season was over, he was comfortable doing both because he put the time in and the Cowboys brought him along that way. And so that, that's all I'm saying. And that is the reason – that over Jack Del Rio, Jason Garrett was the NFL coach of the year. People didn't want to hear it when you when you first started saying it, but what he was able to do with Dak Prescott was unbelievable. And let's not forget also, you mentioned some of those other guys, John Elway, Dan Marino is a third round pick. I mean, yep. it, so it, I mean, it kind of doesn't matter uh, in the National Joe Football. Joe Montana was a third round. Yeah, pick. Ex- exactly. So a lot of these guys they fall down, and it doesn't matter as long as you have the work ethic. A guy who was not at the combine that I think is getting interest from a lot of teams, uh, Detroit and the Saints and the Browns have all taken a look at Joe Mixon. Now, there's a lot of questions about his character because of the incident that happened in Oklahoma where he punched a girl, uh, and in, in the, the league determined that he, wasn't, uh, he didn't deserve to be at the NFL Combine. But he's a hell of a talent, and he ran a fast 40. Um, and it, the question becomes, does he deserve the, you know, the proverbial second chance here? And will he get drafted, I guess, is the question I'm asking you. No, he's going to get drafted. There's <laughs> no ifs, ands, or buts about that, Tiki. He's getting drafted. He's a first-round talent that an owner is going to have to pull the trigger on this one. Like, you know, the, the, the football people are going to present everything to the owner and essentially going to look at their owner. If they really like Mixon, you know it's going to be like in that, in that draft room, Tiki? Yeah. Now, now, sir, can we take him now? No. Okay. <laughs> can we take him now, sir? No. And, and he's going to get drafted. Now, look, all the stuff that happened in the past, if that's my daughter, Joe Mixon's not eligible for the draft because I'm, I'm there to work on Joe. Okay? Yeah. I know violence, meeting violence, is not the right thing in the world, but that's the emotion that, that was stirred up in me when I saw the video. Okay? Getting the story, I had a bunch of, oh, well, she provoked and she did. One more time. Man doesn't put his hands on a woman, right? How many times have we been raised for that, right. let alone cold cocking her with an unbelievable shot? So getting to the core of Joe Mixon is what all the teams are trying to do. I've talked with my Oklahoma friends who I'm talking about in the mix, football department, people I trust big time, and they vouch for him like you would not believe. And I've pressed them pretty hard on it too because I'm like, I'm not buying what you're telling me. And they're like, well, we've known each other for all these years. I'm telling you this kid. So they are, they're standing firm for him. What they find out elsewhere, that's up to the teams. Now, let's take all that out of it, as much as I hate to, because I feel like I'm doing a disservice to the young lady because it always seems like she gets shunted to the side. But if we're just talking strictly football, as a first-round talent, that I think, Tiki, if you have that owner who feels like they can handle the heat, he's going to be gone before day two is over, and that's third round. Wow. I think, I think second to third round. Remember, Frank Clark had a bunch of these issues coming out of Michigan. And Seattle jumped on him in the second round. You remember the, the firestorm they caught? But this is bigger because there's a video. Yeah. So, so whoever it is, they're going to have to plant their feet on this one and be convinced that they can handle all of it. And that's why I'm not sure a big city market 
is going to pull the trigger on Joe Mixon in this case yeah, because too much. that story stays big there. Yeah, I agree. Small market, maybe not as big. We'll see. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you see it often. And, God, I mean, it, I almost feel like the folks at Oklahoma did him a disservice by not letting him speak sooner because we didn't yep. hear anything. They shaded him from the, from the media forever. And the last time we heard from him, well, prior to the end of this season, was at the, at the bowl game the year before, and it just didn't go well. Uh, and yeah. so we don't know I, him. I, and you know, that's, that's, that's part of the risk is you have to know your risk. And because nobody heard from him, you didn't know the risk. To, to your point, let me see if I'm, I'm tracking here. Because he didn't speak at all, it tacitly became he didn't have much he, – he, 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 he wasn't showing enough contriteness. Exactly. You know, it tacitly became, oh, well, so I did it, we move on. That's what you know. That's what you could you know you could infer because we never hear from this kid. We never heard from him to say I'm sorry. We never heard from him saying this, this, and this. Then he gets to the bowl game, and uh, you know it, it became one of those things. Then of course you know Brett Musburger on television trying to say it in his way. Boy, that boy did he catch the flack for it, and he was just trying to say, I, from what I could infer, I think the kid deserves a second chance. Not saying what I thought he did was great because it sure as heck wasn't. But, boy, that became a firestorm for him. So they're going through these little – not little. They're going through these, these issues to get through everything. But Tiki, you saw his pro day yesterday. Yeah. You, saw, you watch his tape. The kid is a heck of a player. Someone's taking this kid. And I'm telling you, I'd be stunned if he gets to day three. Yeah. I think he's coming out day round two or three. I really do. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're probably right. At the end of the day, talent wins out. And if he can convince them he's a good enough or, or re, he's not going to uh, do this again, then he will get taken. Well, we have about a minute here, Charles, and we're talking to Charles Davis, uh, Fox Sports and NFL Network analyst here on Tiki and Tierney. John Ross, I didn't know about. Now, you saw this because you were there. Mm-hmm. He blazed his 40 at 4-2-2, which breaks Chris Johnson's record. He did it in Nike. He's not Adidas, so he doesn't get the island. <laughs> no uh, island. But, but who is this kid? Because I don't know if a lot of people know how good or bad he is and will, or will be in the National Football League, but 4-2-2, you just don't ignore. When I did his games when he was young, okay, I was doing full-time college football, he was a kick return specialist, essentially. At one point, they flipped him to corner. All right, there was a big conversation about him going to corner. This was Steve Sarkeesian was the head coach, as opposed to play a wide receiver. He really developed his receiver skills as time went on. But if you watch a lot of what he does, long routes, bubble screens, tunnel screens, anything to get the ball into his hand, he can. He, you know, listen, because of his speed, he's going to get great cushions. So he's able to break stuff off, especially in the college game. The cushions will tighten down in the NFL because guys can run there too as well. We knew he was going to be fast. Did we know he's going to be four two two? Probably not, but we thought he'd be in the four threes. Yeah. Okay, so that's pretty darn fast. But here was the other thing. He's had injury issues all the way through college and he cramped up and didn't finish the drills at the combine. Yeah, so I noticed. The same that. questions you had going in, you kinda of walked out with the same ones as well. He's not a super big guy either. So I'd be very careful about saying, well, that's going to be my number one receiver. Charles, I appreciate you as always. Fox Sports, NFL Network, you can catch him. He's great, as you just heard. We appreciate you, Charles.